All right, so hi everybody. Uh, uh, great to be here. I wanted to talk about uh, some recent work of mine and also a broader context of problems that I'm interested in. And if you, uh, if you like this kind of problems, I'd be happy to talk uh, while I'm here. So um, uh, as a context for this talk, let me remind everybody the standard uh, supervised learning setting where you're given a training set of uh, examples that comprise a feature vector xi and a label, binary or scalar or something else. For example, uh, samples uh, of images and their label seen on the right. So, so given uh, a lot of such examples, uh, um, we also we, we make the assumption usually, and uh, this is sort of like the uh, the assumption that I want to play with in this talk. So the typical assumption is that these samples are IID from some distribution, and uh, uh, typically we also restrict our attention to a hypothesis class of randomized responses mapping uh, feature vectors to responses, and. Um, uh, for example, this could be a, a linear functions, or it could be a, a some class of deep neural networks, etc. And um, uh, typically, uh, and we're also given a loss function for how much we pay if we make a wrong prediction of a label of some example. And typically, our uh, goal is to select uh, a hypothesis in our uh, class of hypotheses to minimize the expected loss uh, uh, of, uh, that we will pay if we use the uh, response mechanism we identified to predict the label of, example of this example against the true label for a fresh sample that is drawn from the same distribution. I hope this setting this seems familiar and makes sense. Uh, oftentimes, we make the realizability assumption. That is to say that the data that we see uh, does come from a, uh, a response mechanism in our hypothesis class. And if we make such realizability assumption, then oftentimes the goal is to estimate the parameter of interest, the parameter theta that uh, determines how feature vectors are mapped to responses. So this is a very standard setting that we study in machine learning. And just to give a few examples to put it in uh, context. Uh, OK, so this is the maybe simplest uh, example. So linear regression can be viewed in this, uh, uh, from this lens. So in linear regression, we're given n feature vectors, x1 through xn. And for each of them, we have a scalar response. And our assumption, and this is a realizability assumption, that uh, the responses are explained by linear functions, we assume that the responses, each response is a linear function of its own feature vector, plus some uh, unmodeled, uh, so some randomness. So sometimes, uh, let's say, normal 0, 1 yeah. randomness. And the goal is to infer theta. OK, that's, excuse me? Um, it could be that multiple theta stars are good in general. Yeah. Uh, so that's linear regression. It, it falls into our broader framework. Uh, logistic regression is another, uh, you know, very standard uh, example. Here the responses are binary, and um, we assume that the probability that uh, Example i takes a particular sign, plus or minus 1, comes from this probability distribution that uh, somehow contains the projection of the feature vector to the theta, the vector coefficients. And again, it's a realizable setting. We want to infer theta. For these two very standard uh, uh, problems, we have results that look like this. They say that. Uh, the true theta vector can be reconstructed uh, to within a good statistical rate. This is the dimension of the vector. This is the number of samples we see. As long as the design matrix, x, which is the matrix that contains all the feature vectors, has good singular values. So I, I don't specify a specific uh, 
I won't tell you how this uh, order here depends on the minimum singular value, but like there are many results of this form in the literature. Okay, just. Uh, so uh, Uh, th uh, so, th so D is the dimension of its feature vector, uh, and, in, and also the vector of coefficients in the two examples that I just showed. <coughs> N is the number of examples. Uh, right. So, so this right. So this theorem is uh, about linear and logistic linear. regression. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Right, so more broadly, uh, and you know, th that pertains better to deep learning, uh, we, we, you know, we do not assume realizability and we want to just select one hypothesis that minimizes our loss. And uh, you know, at examples of results that we have in this setting are, uh, for example, uh, some classical results that, uh, for example, choosing the empirical uh, risk minimizer, which is the best hypothesis for the sample, attains pretty good uh, error as long as the hypothesis class isn't very rich. So we get results of the form that uh, loss under the true distribution is close to the loss under the, uh, um, uh, so, so the, the, the empirical risk minimizer, which is selected to minimize the empirical loss, against the true distribution attains loss that is not much worse than the best uh, hypothesis in our class, as long as this, uh, we have enough sample in comparison to the complexity of the class we're optimizing over. And there are various versions of this theorem with VC dimension or Ademar complexity, uh, a, 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 et cetera. So you are not talking about efficient algorithms? Not right now, yeah. Mm. Now, <laughs> Uh, of course, if you want to apply such a tool, you have to understand the complexity of the class. And uh, when it comes to neural networks, uh, which, uh, which are not the focus of this talk, but when it comes to neural networks, these results, uh, you know, we, did, we don't have good bounds on the complexity of the classes, and these bounds become a bit meaningless. But in any event, like, so this paradigm, in any event, of supervised learning with IID. Uh, samples uh, is the standard framework in which we look at uh, statistical learning, and you know if you take the setting on steroids, you get uh, you know big neural networks that have amazing performance, uh, even comparable to humans. Okay, okay so uh, you probably have seen this plot. This is the top error, uh, top five uh, error rate on uh, the ImageNet data set and the progress of deep neural networks in time, uh, which has s surpassed uh, or is claimed to have surpassed uh, human performance. Um, but, but arguably, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what these types of plots really mean. Uh, and uh, sort of like, uh, essentially, so, so the starting point of this, the, 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 this, this is the context of this talk, and uh, the, the reason I'm not really convinced what these types of plots really mean is that uh, it's just that the standard setting that your train set uh, contains IID samples from a distribution and your uh, ML model will be evaluated against that same distribution is just too strong. And sort of like the, what motivates uh, my recent work in this space is uh, trying to uh, get guarantees when uh, these strong assumptions fail. And the types of th complexities that I, I want to understand is what happens if you have these three types of uh, challenges that have to do with bias in your training set, or when you have dependencies in your training set, or when you have s s strategy. And I'll explain what that means in, in your training set. So. Uh, um, so censoring and bias refers to the systematic missing of data uh, from the training set you have collected, and uh, w but then you would be evaluated against data that doesn't have this missing. Hmm. Yeah. 
which makes uh, your training set that you are trained on different from the test set that you will be evaluated against. So uh, unless you understand the potential bias and take it into account in your learning, you're going to be bad in a future distribution that has shifted from your training distribution. Uh, data dependencies, which is uh, really the, the focus of today's talk, uh, has to do with the fact that many times data are collected on a network or a temporal domain or a spatial domain, and for this reason they are dependent. Uh, I'll get to the complexities of what that uh, uh, implies, but uh, a main one uh, is that uh, uh, without independence, uh, uh, you lack uh, an apparent source for uh, statistical power. Um, and, and, and finally, uh, the, the third challenge refers to the fact that oftentimes learning uh, and decision making take place in the context of other learning agents. So when you learn uh, and make decisions, you have to do so uh, in anticipation of what other people are going to do. Uh, so uh, you need uh, to be able to do counterfactuals that also take into account behavioral uh, uh, aspects of other agents, learning agents, uh, learning and, and decision making. So these are sort of like three types of complexities that I'm interested in. Uh, uh, so please, if you're interested in any of these, come talk to me. Uh, so you're not showing any, any connection between these sets of uh, which, of, which of the three? <laughs> the sentiment, the bias one. Yeah, so I'll come to that. Uh -huh. Yeah. For, for the data dependent, or oh, the censoring, you mean? There has to. Bias, whatever yeah, so there has to be some connection that you will exploit, otherwise, there's nothing you can do. That's yeah. Cool. Right. So, yeah, so again, so today I'm going to focus here, but uh, uh, in a talk I'm giving on Thursday, I will touch a bit upon the, the last parts. So, censoring, uh, I'm not going to talk about. Okay, so, uh, so today's topic uh, is uh, a statistical inference from depending obser dependent observations. And a nice picture to have in mind when we think about dependent observation is this. This is statistical inference under. Uh, independent observations and this is under dependent observations okay so uh, where you know in the worst case scenario all your data aligns and there's essentially no statistical power in your sample uh, don't take this too seriously <laughs> Within the image, uh, the population is, uh, the, the examples are independent over here, the, and they're super correlated. Uh, yes. Uh, OK, so why uh, do we care about uh, dependence? Because as I said, a lot of the times uh, data is collected on a spatial or temporal domain uh, or a social network. And for this reason, things are dependent. Uh, of course, uh, this has been studied a lot in statistical physics where particles that are close influence each other's behavior, but also in the context of behavior on the so social network where decisions uh, uh, at different nodes are affected by uh, network effects. Uh, I'm not going to, of course, this is a you know, very long uh, uh, literature and I, I cannot really do it justice here. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, dependence in say long ra and, and spatial uh, uh, correlations have been studied a lot in uh, for spin systems, but also in machine learning for uh, m motivating Markov random fields, Bayesian networks, and Bol Boltzmann machine and other high dimensional uh, 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 distributional models. Uh, and they have found a lot of applications in s many many fields. Um, in uh, social networks, uh, several recent uh, uh, papers study uh, how uh, behavior is influenced by peer effects in the context of criminal networks, uh, school achievement, obesity, uh, uh, welfare participation, and other uh, behaviors. Um, this data set is an interesting data set, ad health data set collected uh, across the nation in schools where 
the friendship network among students uh, is uh, um, uh, is basically collected, uh, as well as a lot of feature vectors for students and also like uh, uh, behavioral be behavioral uh, uh, data for students. Uh, so it's a good data set to try uh, different uh, in practice different theories. Uh, and you know, then again, I'm not going to do justice to that literature. In microeconomics, uh, behavior and opinion dynamics have been studied in the context of networks and. Uh, econometrics has been done here where uh, you, you try to disentangle individual from network effects uh, in the context of uh, A-B testing and uh, treatments and so on and so forth. So this is sort of like the uh, context and now let me switch to some uh, models and, and, and results. So what I want to do is I want to take the standard uh, in the beginning of the talk I wanted to talk I I'll talk about what happens to linear and logistic regression in the context of dependent observations and then I'm going to take a more general uh, uh, approach to look at statistical learning theory more broadly uh, but for the first part what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the standard models that I showed you earlier and, 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 and see how they may change in the context of uh, uh, networks. So again, in standard linear regression, you have uh, uh, n feature vectors, and conditioning on these feature vectors, each response variable is independently sampled by uh, a Gaussian in this example, uh, where the mean is this, and uh, there is fluctuation around that mean. And the goal is to infer theta. So that picture there is reminding you that in this picture, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about independent data, then I want to understand what, how this may change uh, if you are in the, in the context of dependent data or in a network. So, uh, so I want to make the following changes when I go to the network. Okay? So I want to drop the independence, the conditional independence of the y's given the x's. So that's being dropped. And I, and I want to see that the response of uh, the i-th the the uh, node uh, uh, is influenced by the behavior of the other guys. Okay? So I don't know, like, uh, for, for, let's say for, for to make sense of this uh, problem, let's think of uh, some social uh, behavior, say how much alcohol you're consuming per week. And um, what I want to assume is that uh, what, how much you, alcohol you consume depends on yourself, but also on your friends in the network. Uh, and um, uh, in this model that I wrote down, for example, I assume that how much you deviate from your own uh, base, uh, like uh, individual uh, consumption, depends on how much uh, in aggregate your uh, friends uh, uh, deviate. Uh, uh, and where AIJ are the, is the strength of your link to person J, uh, plus noise, which is independent. All right, so now I'm thinking about the conditional response of node I conditioning on his own xi, but also the xi's of the others and the responses of the others. So, so the error in the responses to the others? I don't excuse me? Yeah, I mean, your aij connects the y's i to the error in the prediction of yj. aij is how strong? Yeah, uh, no, but yeah. it's a very specific connection. In principle, it can depend both on yj and xj. Oh, you mean this function? Yeah, it could be you can drop this. Maybe it just depends on how much alcohol, it's other, and it could be a more general function. Okay. Uh, um, right. So I mean, these are example problems. Uh, it may be known. It may be parametric. Uh, uh, but but let's think about it. Right. So uh, uh, how, how many observations do I have? I have n observations. Theta is, has dimension d. Uh, I have this uh, beta, which is uh, a scalar. It's the how, how social, let's say, this behavior is. I mean, I cannot make this completely unknown because this is n by n. So I can assume it's known or I can assume it's parametric, but uh, it has to be a lower dimensional f for me to be able to uh, infer it. And, and any, 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 any such uh, uh, setting is, is uh, reasonable in, uh, depending on the context. Sample, which 
really worth in worst case as long as the next lecture gives any information you it will, uh, it will uh, teach you something about the current type of thing. You mean if I don't make parametric assumptions about the noise or if it's not uh, no, there at all? Right. So it's simpler, so it's very nice. Right. And there and there, yeah. we know what to do, right? I mean, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is not even to certain, this is a linear function. And in principle, you just do linear regression. You just <coughs> know anything about it. Yeah, so it's. Uh, uh, if you'd have some models that you could work with, but that's all. <coughs> so no, what I'm saying is. There's no linearity here, it's just a linear function of x. Uh, no, there, there is, right? I mean. No, even if you know the A's, right? I mean, so, okay, so let, let me do, let me write down two models and work out the linear algebra, right? So, so, so I'm going to do one version uh, with this there and one version without this there, yeah, right? Yeah. Right? So so yeah. yeah. Uh, that's right, yeah. So this is this is this linear. I mean, this this is uh, called a linear autoregressive model, and there is a lot of work on, uh, on that model, right, already. Um, but just to see kind of like the linear algebra here, let's see. So let me do this model. So let me do this model. So if I collect everything on this side, I have, if I collect the y's on one side and uh, so, so the effect, what is the effect of the network, right? So the effect, so, so if there's no noise, this is the problem you want to fit. There is an unknown beta and there is an unknown theta. So it's not a linear regression problem, but you can try to fit that. So that you, you, you want to identify this guy and this guy. If the noise, you have the effect that the network both uh, rotates your base response. So this would be the, your base response if things were independent. So the network rot rotates these things and also the noise. So it correlates the noise as well. If I if I drop if I add this thing in, I I can I can drop this, and this becomes closer to the generalized linear regression, which is simpler to analyze. Okay, if beta is small. So what makes it non-linear? A little bit non-linear is beta, S especially around the assume fixed beta. I don't assume. If beta is f if beta is known if uh, if beta is known it's just a linear regression. I agree. <laughs> right. Yeah. But so yeah. So what I want to do in these types of things is to understand. I'm given the network. I ask people your about their friendships. I um, ask people about their features. I ask people about their responses, and then I want to understand uh, the the individual effect and how strong the network effect is. Now, let's look at logistic regression. Um, now, again, the, uh, now the responses are binary, plus minus one. Uh, if I was in the standard setting, they would be conditional independent given the XIs. They would be sampled from this probability distribution. F to go to the dependent world, I want to drop the independence. I want to say that conditioning on everybody else my response uh, is now coming from this probability distribution that depends on the others. And again, given the friendship network, the x's and the y's, I want to understand the, the individual effect and the beta. Now, in both cases, I've given you the conditional sampling of yi conditioning on the other guys. Over there, for the linear model, I wrote down the joint sampling of the y. What is the joint sampling over here of the y? So, so if I want to jointly sample the whole y vector, 
the probability distribution is that uh, is this. So you have, uh, as you might recognize, you have a Nising model where Right, so uh, s s s sigma i is the spin of a node i, plus or minus 1. Uh, theta xi is the external field on node i. Beta is the inverse temperature. And this is the uh, pairwise uh, network effects. And this z function here depends on uh, these guys and beta. All right, so this is. And I'll focus on this model today. Okay, so uh, right, so like, uh, so the, let's say the uh, the example that I want to think have in my head is uh, A is a school. Um, X i is a feature vector for a student. Y i is do they like math or do they not like math? And I want to assume that how much you like math, you like math. If, oh, sorry. <laughs> Whether you like math or not depends on yourself and also uh, how many of your good friends uh, like math. All right? And to sample people's uh, uh, preferences about whether they like math or not, I'm sampling an Ising model like that. Uh, and again, I want to identify the individual effect and the, and the beta coefficient. And um, um, OK, so this is what I said. Uh, so the challenge in this problem that I want to deal with is the fact that I have one sample from this probability distribution, right? Because I went to, I don't know, Princeton, I collected this data, and I just know how much every student likes math. Uh, whether every student, whether each student likes math or not, I cannot go tomorrow and ask them again. They're going to give me the same response. So I have only one sample from this model. Uh, it's a big sample, so it has n, uh, it's an n dimensional sample, and uh, I'm trying to figure out a lower dimensional theta and beta, but the challenge I'm facing is it's a dependent sample. So uh, we know that uh, this, this type of problem does change very, diff very much in, in difficulty depending on, on age. I mean, Uh, I will tell you what I assume. I, I, I will not assume uh, one or two dimensional. I'm going to make some spectral bounds on eh? uh, And the reason I have to do that, I mean, first of all, like what is important is the interaction of beta and A. But um, for, 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 for a sec, to build intuition, let's say A is an adjacency matrix of some graph and look at beta. The, the one comment I want to make is that this problem is not always identified, like the, the theta is not always identifiable. If beta is too large, you're in a school where the peer effects are very strong. So if beta is very large, if beta is sent to infinity, then this uh, measure becomes degenerate to the all plus one vector or all, one, all minus one vector with equal probability. So you know, you go to that school, you see everybody liking math, you don't know, uh, uh, you cannot identify the individual effects, okay? So there's no hope to uh, solve this problem if um, I don't place any bounds on beta because then the network effect may swamp the uh, individual effect. Similarly, if beta is very small, then uh, this effect may be swamped by this. So I have to, to identify both theta and beta, I have to put some upper bounds on uh, beta or its interaction with A and some lower bounds on uh, a. Uh, the last comment is that for beta equals zero, I made it earlier, it's uh, vanilla logistic regression. So this generalizes vanilla logistic regression. And the challenge, again, with one sample is that uh, uh, you know, a lot of statistical inference is based on uh, low of la like uh, CLTs and low of large numbers. And here you, you just lost that because you're looking at just one big dependent sample. So if you want to extract statistical power, you have to build some concentration of measure for your estimator out of this one big sample. OK, so let me state a theorem and then see how to approach it. So what are the conditions to be? So what I'm shooting for is to get an estimator that uh, reconstruct the true theta beta 
to within error root dimension over n. So what are the assumptions I need to do that? So uh, two types of assumptions. One are the standard ones that you need for standard linear regression. And uh, these are, have to do with uh, placing a lower bound on the design matrix, on the, singular, on the small singular value of the design matrix. Um, the new assumptions that I have to add are, uh, as motivated by my discussion earlier, I have to assume that uh, some spectral bounds on A, okay? And, and the types of, and the bounds that I place for the results I'm gonna say is that uh, beta and the infinity norm of A are bounded. And also the Frobenius norm of A is lower bounded. So I place upper and lower bounds on uh, the matrix and an upper bound on beta. So I don't want beta to go, the inverse temperature to go, the temperature to go very close to zero inverse temperature to go to infinity. Okay, so does the statement make sense? So I wanna get these uh, nice rates and I wanna understand under what uh, generalizations of logistic regression I can still get these bounds. But if that has not been bounded to zero from infinity, you mean you are doing in the high temperature regime, I think. Um, Uh, yes and no. So uh, actually, uh, in terms of phase transitions, I will allow beta to be in a regime of uh, low temperature. So I, I will, uh, as um, I mean, uh, right. So, so there is there, there are many conditions for uh, being in high temperature, like the Brusim's condition and other conditions. In fact, uh, the setting I'm describing here can actually be in low temperature. That, that's not is, is the, there's not going to be a transition between high and low temperature in in this theorem. How does the big O? Uh, good question. I think it's uh, e to the beta. <laughs> yes, e to the upper bound on beta. Yeah. So I mean, uh, it shouldn't grow with n. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and actually, it should be a good, small, reasonable constant. So I mean, the transition between high and low, roughly speaking, happens at beta equals one. The way I have normalized things. Right. But A is bounded, yeah. So once A gets uh, some details in A, you mention high beta, you want to, to reverse them to get to the rationality of the problem. And, uh, when we know this model for about 100 years now. Well, that's, that, uh, that I agree with, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but I guess my point is that this does not have to be high temperature. That's my point. Uh, okay, so what, is the, what are some proof ideas? Uh, okay, so what you, uh, okay, so, uh, so, okay, so I guess there I have a cheat sheet to remember what I'm talking about, okay? So th this is my problem, right? So my joint measure is that, this Ising model with the external fields and the temperature. All right, so, Okay, so the likelihood of the model uh, d depends on this partition function that involves theta and beta, and that is hard to work with. So instead of working with the likelihood, I'm going to work with what's called the pseudo-likelihood, introduced by Besag as far as I know, but maybe earlier. So what is the pseudo-likelihood? Pseudo-algorithm is a make-belief uh, product measure, uh, which is this. Imagine that, look at the product measure where you resample every node conditioning on uh, the neighbors. This, this is not a real probability distribution on the y's, but I can write this product. The exponent doesn't matter, okay? So it's a, because I'm, okay? Uh, and so this likelihood, I can now write down explicitly, the, this pseudo likelihood, because the conditional measure is just that. Okay, it's just a logistic function applied on, 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 on this. Uh, the parentheses are a bit weird. No, yeah, it's good. It's not normalized. Excuse me? It's not normalized. What do you mean normalized? The partition function. So correct. L then that's, that's why we yeah, like this function. It's not a probability distribution. It's not a probability distribution. Uh, 
Now, the good though, thing is that it does not have a partition function. Okay. The question is, is it consistent? So, so Chatter G in 07 uh, uh, said, yes, it is. Uh, so does uh, uh, optimizing that, okay, so this function is concave, so I can optimize it. Uh, is the optimum the true, does it identify the true parameter? Uh, so Chatterjee in 2007 showed that if you don't have a theta, if you have um, this model where the, the model is symmetric and, and you're trying to identify beta, the answer is yes under the spectral bounds that I stated. Um, the answer is also yes when uh, um, I write something here, but basically when this is the same for every known. It's not a linear, it's not a logistic regression problem, but uh, it's a trivial model where everybody has the same feature one and then uh, it's just the, s the same parameters, uh, two parameters, one scalar here and one scalar there. Um, so what we try to do here is to do the general case. So when you have a What is the what? Like there, there needs to be some model on A, right? Because if you grow N, A changes. Correct. So you have, I mean, so you have A and N changing together, right? So that's why I, that's why in the theorem statement you have, yeah, so you have, you want as N goes to infinity, you want uh, this to remain bounded and this to, to increase like N. Okay, so how about the general case? So this is what we started in this work. Uh, again, uh, now my cheat sheet, general problem, pseudo likelihood is there. Um, okay, I mean, oh, I have something here, but don't worry about it. So it's not, it's not something interesting, super interesting. So th this is the picture. So this is the log pseudo likelihood. This is the wrong function to optimize. Uh, okay, but it's concave, so you optimize it, you get here. This is the truth. This is the, the, the distribution that is generating your data. So what you want to do is you want to argue that the optimum that you got by optimizing the wrong thing is close to the <coughs> a truth. So one way to prove that is to argue that the gradient here is not too large and also that the, this function is strongly concave. So, so if the gradient here is not too large and the function is strongly concave, then these two things, the, the, the L2 distance between these two guys can be bounded. Uh, uh, right, so this is the picture I want you to remember and forget about this, it's, it's, ca it's trivial calculations, but uh, the point is that the, uh, so this cancels the square here. So basically the L2 distance between the maximum and this other point is bounded by the gradient at this other point over the smallest uh, eigen the the smallest eigenvalue of the uh, uh, log like uh, the pseudo log likelihood. Okay, so I hope that makes sense, right? I mean, so if you're very concave and your gradient is small, you can bound your distance. for the square norm, correct. So the plan is uh, to show that the gradient of this function uh, at the true parameters is small. So the gradient of this guy, the, the gradient of this function, if I plug in uh, beta naught, theta naught, which is the truth, is small. Uh, and in particular, what we show is that uh, the gradient of the log, the, gra the gradient of the log pseudo likelihood, is bounded by d over n, with some constant probability. And we show that the minimum eigenvalue of the 
negative log pseudo likelihood is uh, bounded by a constant with constant probability. So what is the distribution order for this statement? Uh, what is random in uh, y? Uh, yeah, only y is random. And y uh, depends on theta naught, beta naught. The rest are just functions that I came up with. And I'm interested in the value of that function, the, its gradient at a particular point, which corresponds to the truth. And it's Hessian. Yeah. Can you, yeah, can you explain this? What is it saying to you, this zero and then? Yeah, so what it says to you is that sort of like, uh, 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 okay, so the L2 distance between, so, so my final goal is to argue that this L2 distance is bounded by root D over N. So if I have a bound of uh, root D over N for this guy and a constant bound for this guy, I get root D over N. Is that, is that, what, is this guy what does it mean? Yeah, so let me, let me write, so what does it mean? Uh, Yes. How many teachers each student has? Yes. Standard, uh, standard regression bound from the last. Correct. For, dependent, for independent data is the standard one. So we want to recreate it. So, so let me first sh argue, uh, sort of like uh, point out what is the difficulty here is. So you have uh, this function. So, so this is a function of the y's. This is, this is the relevant. This is what is random. So what is random are the y's. This function, but you, you're looking at this at uh, two particular points, but you want to look at it as a function of the y's, which is the only thing that will determine <coughs> if, the grade, if, the, if its norm is big or small. Uh, and sim about what this function means. So I remember the pseudo likelihood was the pretend product distribution. Yeah. So what does this expression mean? How does it look? Um, Does it mean that uh, n is much larger than b, then you get close to the true class? Uh, no, no. So, okay, so let it, right, so, right. Um, what, what, what do you want it to mean? This thing. So let's, this, um, Let's say that uh, at least for this expression is close to this Fisher information matrix. That is important for, for likelihood. But ex except I have put pseudo likelihood as opposed to likelihood there. Um, so, but I mean, I, to be honest, besides this algebra, I, I don't have a, mi like, a, I, I, I don't want to assign a meaning to the pseudo likelihood, but. Uh, I want to make a couple of points. Uh, excuse me? It does say that it's Fisher information after some modification is dependent on the This one. It's a larger user information than the independent one. So you need more examples. But otherwise, it's the same type of information. I, I don't know, actually, if, I need, if it's worse than the, if it's, if it's yeah, more. The is you, are, you, have, you need more examples. Oh, yeah. So the, the Fisher information can be larger. What, what I'm suggesting is that this is a good proposal for what to do if you have dependencies instead of the yeah. Fisher information matrix of the true likelihood. I, I think it's, you can think about in classical statistics when you have what they call sequences of fixed design, and this is exactly the thinking in econometrics, is that you never believe in independence, you just have sequences of fixed design, and it's traditional in econometrics to write that as a deterministic assumption. Like your sequences of Hessians grows like this, and then you get consistency, right? A sequence of fixed design, but I guess, so you, you... could write lambda min of x transpose x grows like n. Right, I guess... Ident assuming identifiable. Right. And in the independence case, you prove it, and then in the dependence case, you can potentially prove it. Right, and I guess uh, one, one difference with that, though, is the following, that uh, if you have sequences of fixed designs, then... Uh, the next uh, yi depends on the previous ones. So here, everything depends on everything. So uh, no, they have sequences of fixed designs, but they're like just sequencing the problems. They can be 
completely unrelated problems. But then what in econometric they do is they put enough assumptions on the sequence so that it's consistent. Like for example, mm. yeah. So yeah. So in this calculation, where does V enter in the algebra? In the dimension of the matrix. So. The matrix which ma which matrix are you talking about? A, A is N by N, yeah. Yeah. Right. So so here, here here's the uh, right. So let me let me finish my points and I'll get to that. Right. So, um, uh, the challenge with un understanding these two quantities that we want to understand is that these are functions of the yi's which are all dependent. So if I want to bound, uh, you know, if I want to upper bound this or lower bound that, I need to do some type of concentration of measure for functions of dependent random variables. So the question is, how am I going to do that? And uh, what we, uh, so, so uh, you know, de depending on what function you're looking at, you may or may not be able to prove such things. And it all depends on as I said, here we're in a potentially low temperature regime, so many quantities of the Ising model do, do not concentrate. Right? For example, the sum of the Ys does not concentrate in low temperature. It could be, you know, for, you know with some probability it could be mostly plus, with some probability it could be mostly minus, it does not concentrate well. Uh, uh, so the question is, do these particular quantities concentrate, and how to prove that? And, and, and you know, and, and as it turns out, you can use um, a exchangeable pairs technology to argue that these specific functions concentrate, and it does depend on the functional form that I have to open up to show you why you may expect them to concentrate. Roughly speaking, um, roughly speaking, these quantities uh, contain uh, things of the. Um, you know, like it's th there are polynomials on the y's, but but maybe s somewhere in the polynomial you have something like this. Right? And uh, what is good about this is that conditioning on everybody else, the expectation of this guy is this. So what you want to do is you want to use some exchangeable pair technology to decouple this guy from that guy and, and use concentra concentration measure that is known for these types of quantities, for the Ising model, even in low temperature. Now, you know, why it comes out to be D over N, so I... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess not right now because I have to open up the uh, functional form. I I don't have good intuition to explain. Okay. No, but, but look, so yeah. the, the root D over N would arise even if this was not there, right? So it's the standard right you get. Yeah, but, but, but one thing is that this root D over N comes from the standard logistic regression problem. Right, so, okay, so roughly speaking, if we were in a standard regression problem, what determines the concentration that you get are eigenvalues of what is called the Fisher information matrix at the optimum. 
And that, is, uh, that feature information method depends only on the dimensionality of your parameters, which is D in this case. Yeah, so, I, I so you have a... I do see that if A was zero, right. which is the case of the... Yeah. I see that you should get by the independent result, you should get G over N. Right. right. So uh, if all you're saying to me is that uh, the other term by the other calculation of computational measure, measure is negligible compared to this, then fine. Is this what you're saying? Uh, I don't know. Uh, not th no, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying so what? Right. Okay. I mean, uh, what I'm saying. Okay. What I'm saying is that under my conditions, uh, this holds both without the with beta equals zero and without beta equals zero. So, in in the, in that sense, I I say that. Yeah. To the yes. Right. Uh, that's not true, but uh, in the calculation, in the calcul in the calculation, not in the behavior, not in the sampled wise, but uh, yes, in this calculation, it is it, it is concentrating enough to uh, uh, make it negligible effect. I that I don't that. <laughs> so you see the so you see the reason why I'm saying not is because. Uh, as I said, this model is also spanning low temperature regime. So in the low temperature regime, you know, if this say have a trivial effect, you see all people doing plus one or all people doing minus one or most people doing plus one or most people doing minus one. So then the effect is noticeable. So, so what I'm saying is that there are two things that are important, right? So one is, uh, does the analysis, uh, so, so what is the effect of beta in analyzing these terms, which are sufficient to analyze to get your uh, consistency? The other question is, the presence of beta, does it influence what samples you see? And uh, uh, both answers are, are yes. So it influences, it may influence a lot. The existence of beta may influence a lot what samples you collect. You may see all the Ys correlating. Uh, but also, it is true that, as it turns out, the quantities that are, arise in, in analyzing, in analyzing uh, the gradient and the Hessian are fa are, are, have a nice enough structure that uh, allows you to prove concentration, that the concentration you need to for these uh, bounds to go through. So let me give uh, one, one analogy, maybe. Let me give one analogy. So this function of the Ising model in the regime of parameters I'm looking at does not concentrate. Okay? The concentration of this could be plus minus n, whereas for product measures, it's plus minus root n. Okay? So for product measures you and high temperature Ising, you get plus minus root n for this quantity. You get plus minus n for that quantity uh, if uh, in, in, you're in low temperature. On the other hand, this quantity, This quantity concentrates in all regimes of parameters to plus minus root n. So, and I guess some of the point. I mean, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, so for, so for the, yes, for the yeah, bounds that I'm placing. But uh, the, the dimensions of, of the gradient, the all the gradient and the Hessian with respect to theta. So this is a D by D matrix. Here. Correct. That's so, D comes into the game. so this matrix is D. That, that's what I was saying. Like, uh, we're, we're dealing with D plus one dimensional matrices where we're analyzing these quantities. OK, so. Uh, all right, so let me switch to the <laughs> context. Uh, so, okay, so I guess that wraps up. Okay, but this is representative of the complexities you have to deal with if you're doing this type of analysis, right? So, um, so here, you, I mean, in this particular case, you have a biased estimator. 
uh, you have to understand the s size of the bias and boils down to uh, understanding functions of this single correlated sample that you got and it may be favorable or non favorable depending on the bounds that you place uh, uh, Yeah. From the, from the 70s. Yeah. Uh, I assume it was used in, in other contexts. So it, it is used. Uh, it's a way to get totally independent distribution from different responses. Yeah, it, it is very well motivated when your graph kind of looks like this. So if your graph looks like this and you pick this node only, this node, this node, for example, I guess this node, yeah, I guess any independent set is good, then writing that function is correct. You can try to optimize that function. This conditioning on, conditioning on these nodes, uh, the distribution of the others is coming from that measure. So it is a very reasonable function to optimize. What you what you are, uh, what you may be afraid of, is that uh, in a low temperature regime, um, the conditioning on this, like for example, if these guys do not are not expected to fluctuate enough uh, uh, with uh, high probability, it could be that you know, like all the neighbors are plus one, and they're all pushing you to. Uh, you know, the flat parts of the logistic function that appears uh, in this formula. And so this is like a, this logit function that kind of like tapers out, like it's a, it goes from like minus one, it has a linear part and it goes to plus one. So uh, what you are, af what you would, should be afraid of if you, th this is, as I said, accurate, but in terms of signal, what you may be afraid of is like, you know, like if it so happens, okay, and it could happen, that the spins of all these guys align, you could be pushed in the flat parts of the logistic of the logistic uh, function, and uh, here the signal is not very good. Um, so uh, again, this is accurate if you do an independent set. In a general graph, you, you, first of all, you would be throwing samples away. So in general graph, you want to put them all together. Um, yeah, and you, and you want to argue that this, you know, like over, you know, using, you know, everybody is not going to affect you. That method has been, you know, w ha has been used a lot in vision tasks, like uh, uh, learning uh, what is called uh, ER ERGMs, exponential random graph models, where again you have a density you're trying to estimate, which has whose energy is an is a uh, some of it all possible motifs that you're interested in, like you know, like how many triangles times some coefficient plus how many squares times some coefficients and so on and so forth, it has been used there a lot for these types of purposes. But in terms of its consistency, the results uh, that I know are the ones I mentioned by Chatterjee for the only missing beta case and by uh, a, a couple of other papers for uh, scalar beta and scalar, like. Uh, like, uh, you know, like just a constant here. So this, this generalizes that work. Okay, more broadly, and I'm not going to dwell into this, I, I remind you the general setting of uh, uh, supervised learning where you have examples, you have a class of hypotheses, you have a loss function, and you assume everything is independent. How would you change that setting to talk about dependence? Well, you want to drop that assumption of independence, and you want to add a different assumption that says that uh, 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 all samples, the training set and the test set, they're all sampled together from some joint distribution D. And you want to keep this the same, except now maybe, uh, you know, uh, depending on what you want to do, maybe you want to predict a conditional. So you want to get a good conditional loss on the test example, conditioning on the, what you have learned from the other guys. Or if you're in a realizable setting, you want to identify theta star, the, the parameters driving that sample. So what I talked about was linear reg logistic regression 
in the realizable settings, what I talked about so far. But you know, more generally, you would like to develop maybe a general statistical learning conditions for a general statistical learning uh, setting. Um, so I have one result in this uh, trying to attain this. Uh, but I have this under stronger assumptions than the one I was talking about. So here I'm going to assume the Bruchin's condition holds. So in particular, you know, your dependent samples are in high temperature. Okay, so the more general setting, the more general types of result I have for this uh, under the Bruchin's condition, which I'm not going to state due to lack of time. But uh, roughly speaking, the results that we get are these. We get uh, VC bounds and uh, a Rademacher type of bounds under samples that are jointly sampled but satisfy the Bruchin's conditions. And uh, sort of the bounds that you get for the under independence can be carried over here. So you lose some log factors for binary classes. So you still have root VC dimension over number of samples, but you pay some logs as far as I know. And uh, for general uh, uh, functions, you replace uh, Radem, like uh, Rademacher complexity with Gaussian complexity, which is a very related notion. And again, you lose log factors. Yes, weak I mean, OK, let me state it. And then uh, I mean, I'm, I'm done, so I might as well state it. So uh, the Bruchin's condition. <laughs> Uh, if you have a joint probability distribution, you can define the influence of variable i to variable j. The influence of i to j is the most that conditioning i on two different values can move the distribution of j. So you get the supremum over setting everybody else except i and j. Setting i to two different values, you're interested in the variation distance of the conditional of j conditioning i on this value and the other guys to that versus conditioning i to this value and the other guys to that. You take the supremum over uh, setting the other guys in two possible settings for i. The most that i can move j, that's the influence of i to j. Uh, and the Bruchin's condition is that for every i, the total, the sum of influences of uh, the other nodes to i is bounded by 1. So it's a uh, infinity bound on the I matrix that, that you have. This uh, I matrix shows up in proving uh, mixing time uh, properties for the global dynamics of this, uh, uh, for this uh, distribution. It also shows up, uh, can be exploited to prove a concentration of measures. So it's an important, uh, uh, this bound is an important spectral bound you can. Uh, you can, I mean, for the Ising model, uh, just to have a sense, like if, you ha if I have, say, an Ising model on a deregular graph, roughly speaking, it says that the theta ij's between nodes is like 1 over d. So you have a deregular graph. I want its influence to be 1 over d, which roughly means that the theta between these two guys is uh, 1 over d, roughly speaking. So Uh, Any normal or I don't know about any norm, but like maybe like spectral norm as well is okay. Yeah, so like this is not tied to get uh, concentration of measure. Yeah. But yeah, that that was basically what I had to say. Like again, I'm interested in these types of uh, going away from the standard model. And uh, thank you very much.